the HR engine. This is the system level. And I'm going to talk about a class now. This is the code now. Now we're actually in the code. And um, I'm going to show you the code example. So let's open up uh, this first example, request mapper. Um, okay, so this is an earlier, oh, it's not showing. Hold on a second. Let's try it this way. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Is that readable enough? Maybe a little bigger. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> if I was going to just describe this a little bit, this document is an object that represents that XML. And there's really only one public method. It's this request data. It's building a hash of that data and turning it into JSON, basically. Somewhere later, it turns it into JSON, but from this hash. So if you came in here and you looked at this, um, you can already see this thing's like 161 lines. It's pretty hefty. I got to come in here. I'm going to probably immediately num like question this number helper. I don't know where that's used yet. Where's that mixed in? Um, I don't really know where this is used yet, you know, because lots of lines of code. Um, this is simple enough. Got a document reader. Public method here is actually pretty decent. I feel like this tells you what it's doing. You can see it's going to return this hash. You know, there's some helper methods for map mapping the patient prescription, that kind of thing. I'm going to scroll down a little bit more here, and then you've got private methods, map prescription, map prescriber. Here's that uh, number to phone that might be the thing that uses, uh, yeah, number to phone must be what this is coming from, it's coming from here. So I figured that out now. Uh, and I don't look at this too often, so I'm kind of looking at it with semi-fresh eyes, to be honest. Uh, we got this other helper here for mapping date of birth. Uh, some weird stuff going on here, payer info. Um, let's see, what else? Anything interesting? Anything catching your eye is like, eh, kind of confusing? Or... Oh. At the very end. What's that? The stuff at the very end is confusing. This stuff here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it looks like we're pulling in some JSON. Uh, not the best, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean... Oh, it's not too bad. What's that? Not so bad. No, it's not terrible. I, this is by far not the worst we've done. <laughs> But I think it was a good example because I had a clear path of how it improved over time. So this is, like, like I said, an, an early version. Um, let me pull up version 2. Okay. Version 2, we kind of like overhauled this thing like crazy. <laughs> we were like, you know what? We're, what we're doing here is we've got a, like a prescriber mapper and a patient mapper. Why don't we pull those private methods out and make classes for those? The reason was because, you know, we, what happened was, it's not that we weren't happy with this, it's that we were asked to change this. So they said, we need to do more. It was getting bad because different clients, different pairs, and things map differently. And it was just gonna, we knew we were just gonna keep adding to this, right? So we said, well, why don't we just kind of break it down and apply the rule of small. So we made this a lot smaller by iterating over a, a bunch of mappers. If you're not really curious, uh, has anybody seen .tap before uh, in Ruby? It's kind of cool. I, we'll geek out about that after. But basically all this is doing is saying, create a hash and merge all the results of all these mappers. And if you're familiar with some of like Ruby's collection helpers and hash class, you would, I think, get that pretty quick. But there's a problem with this, I think. I think it violates kind of the um, one four rules, and that I think you lose some of the expressiveness here. Oops. I mean, this is just kind of technical. It doesn't really say much about what request it is. So we decided to do something a little different, and we said, well, why not this? We're not iterating or anything, but now we're a little bit more explicit about what request it does. So we're. Referencing the mappers the same way, uh, it's just not a collection of them. But this request data thing is way more expressive. It's telling you I'm going to have patient attribute, prescriber attribute, and if you just needed this top level info, you don't need to drill in and 
and figure out what the patient mapper maps as. Like it really, here's a really important one that happens to us a lot. Prescriber can be, uh, oh, sorry, prescriber can be, uh, what's the no another name for doctor? <laughs> doctor, we don't use that one much. Uh, there's another one. Physician. Physician, yeah, there you go. So that gets switched around sometimes, right? So if I needed to know which one it was, I don't have to dig any further, just tell me. So this expresses that quickly, I think. Um, otherwise, you would definitely have to dig into this thing and see how like, the hash that was merging in and look at it and stuff. So I feel like that's better. Um, OK. So let's look at some of these, I guess. Patient mapper. <clears throat> There's some other stuff going on here uh, that helped, I think. So we have these, not that number helper thing. We're putting where that was needed a lot closer to where it's used. But you can kind of immediately see, all right, well, do you go here? Not too hard to find. Um, pretty con concise thing. You can kind of look at it, see what's going on. Easy to write tests for this. If you think about writing tests for kind of a complex mapping process, then um, you can isolate this class very easily instead of having one big, you know, whole slew of unit tests for one big mapper. And this is actually this is a little bit dumbed down. <laughs> like I said, we added a lot, a lot of complexity. There's, there's actually a, probably some more private methods and stuff in this today. Um, the other thing to notice is this address helper. So if we talk about um, the dry principle that I, we haven't really covered yet, I think in talking about this, what we realized is that um, the uh, address. For patients, physicians, and I think you know anywhere else in the standard, we're the same. So we didn't really need to duplicate that mapping for addresses. So we got this address helper that does that for us. So pretty simple. We can reuse that. I think it's nice. I mean, there's complexity here that's I think really subtle. Street one, address line one. That's like important stuff because you mess it up and it's wrong, right? Like, it's, if it's in two places, you got two places you can mess that up. <clears throat> so, you get asked to change how we have map addresses, there you go. Not hard to find, I don't think. Um, okay, what else? I don't know, that might be it. Do we have a, look? Do we have a number four? No. I did want to talk about testing a little bit. Is there any questions so far? Because I'm going to kind of move away from this code, I guess. Do we have questions so far? I saw a, a date conversion to CMM date. Is that like some sort of like weird date format that healthcare uses that we don't know about? I think it was, um, CMM is uh, short for cover my meds. Oh, okay. Yeah, so and it's... we um, kind of format dates in our core APIs in a oh. way that, you know, it's a certain way. Okay. And it would be nice if it were more standard actually, but we have a helper that does okay. it, that's fine. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I actually put that, uh, that coding where I get to it easily. Okay. So it seems like going, all the mapping is like pretty direct, right? Is there a lot of, there are places where there's context that, that modifies the mapping? Yeah, I, like I said, I kind of simplified what we're doing here. Let me think of a, okay, maybe the payer mapper. I don't think I would have, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's definitely some form of context. Um, some of it's based on the data we have. I mean, really, it all does come down to the data. That document, you know, has things like payer identifiers and stuff. And based on what they are equal to, we'll change the way we the way we map things. Um, just to give you an example, I guess, really the com most complex part I think is finding the right payer identifiers. So they give us all different ways of telling us who their payer is. And it's kind of surprising sometimes, like EHR systems have a hard time doing that because they're not used to the needing to know the payer for a drug. Um, so they're really figuring that out now. 
but we essentially take whatever we can get. And based on however much information we can get, we can prioritize our strategy for finding the pair that we actually need to send this data to to get the drug approved. And I would say probably that way more than the patient mapper and all that is complex, for sure. But I don't think I pulled that out because it was kind of hard to clean up for demo. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about, I have a story about testing, test coverage. Um, line 3 and line 4 are, are real, two real lines of code that I encountered. Um, and uh, the class and all that doesn't really matter. But I came across these two lines of code when I was asked to add header data for documents that are of the type error. And so I go to this line four here and it's explicitly saying don't map, don't populate header data uh, if it's dot error, right? So it's saying do the opposite. So I was like, well that's weird, right? So one of the first things I did was remove this and run the tests. And what do you think happened? <laughs> Nothing failed, right? So that was like the bad thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was hoping that you were going to say testing failed. <laughs> Normally it would. Normally what I can do is I can remove something that doesn't make sense to me, run the test and get a pretty descriptive failure that's like, when these things are true, this should happen, that kind of thing. Well, that didn't happen. So I was like, who did this? Uh-oh. And this is obviously not the repository, so it says me. But you know, the person that did it, I was like, all right, I'm just going to ask them real quick. Um, like, you know, so I send him a hip chat, like, what's up? You know, and he's on vacation, he's on a mountain somewhere. <laughs> and like I said, so we pair. So I was like, who was he pairing with? At that time, I asked his manager, who was he pairing with when he did this? You know, uh, and she's like, oh. Yeah, he was an intern and he's not, he's at college now. <laughs> so I don't have anybody to talk to you about this line of code. I think probably even before I did all that, I looked up this shop and I found out the PRs it was connected to. PR really seemed unrelated to what was going on with the unless here. So I immediately think, you know what they did is they copied this line, pasted it here because you could see in the, in the diff that this became, you know, this was here, line three was there before, line four was new. I was like, I bet they just copied and pasted it. Or something like that, you know? Yeah. So they put it there on accident. And that's, that is what happened, but I had to go spend a lot of my day tracking down, this is from another vertical, right? This happened to be in a project where we're integrating with the PBM guys, and they're a big team, and they deal with a lot of traffic, and I didn't want to mess up anything they were doing, be a big deal. So I find out, you know, if you guys have some higher level tests I can run end to end, and that was going to take setup, and you spent the afternoon working with the test engineer to get some lights on tests and stuff to make sure that this would work with <laughs> that dog. So that really just gets to the point, I think. Like, um, like I said, for the most part, at least on my team, and I would say in general, we're pretty good pretty good TD years and we wouldn't normally miss something like that. It seems so small, but it really is a big deal when you start talking about big systems. So you just put a comment next to it. We don't know why this works, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like that for years. Uh, my change ended up being easy. I mean, I didn't have to write a lot of code to get the thing working that we wanted to work, but, you know, the amount of time and legwork I had to do to make sure it was cool was pretty intense, I guess. Um, so that's it for uh, the code examples. Any, anything else you guys want to talk about on that? Okay. So while we're on the subject of uh, testing, um, we had that big request mapper. And I just imagine this sort of thing test coverage. So you've got that one class, and you've got test coverage around it. Well, what I normally do, um, is I do the refactor first and make sure that's nice because you can change the code, do some extract class refactorings here, and your tests are still passing, you're good. Um, but then you've got your 
test coverage here, and it's, I would say that's still valid, but in terms of simplicity, you can apply the rules to test too. So I do, um, I don't know the name for it, so I've been calling it chasing the implementation with your tests. So of course, you still got the big circle that covers, well really I guess you don't need the big circle, you really just need this one, right? It's covering that class. But you want to probably go to that spec and pull the stuff that's specific to patient mapping and pair mapping and stuff and put them down the, uh, the mappers because it's so much more clear for the next person, right? When they go and they have to change something on the patient mapper, like I said, for TD gears, so we immediately look for the patient mapper spec. If it's not there, it's kind of hard to find where that test is happening. So, you know, you can kind of go up the chain and find that stuff there, but if you're really trying to keep things nice and neat for everyone, it's good to pull those tests down around what you just added and extract it out. Um, that's kind of it for that. Um, it's kind of it for my talk, too. I hope I didn't come too under time, but maybe we can talk about stuff. Definitely open to that. Um, simplicity rules are there. You can come work with me. Uh, that's already open. <laughs> that's pretty much it. I recommend Corey's book for sure. Questions, comments? Have you ever heard of, you ever heard of the book uh, Design Anti-Patterns? It's like an orange mm. book, book. No, I haven't. So there's this idea. Of, you know, there's this whole book called Design Patterns, mm. and then like there's another book that came out called Anti Patterns. Oh, that's cool. And they called your 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 class that you split up. They called that the blob. Oh yeah. And then there was another anti pattern called Lava, which where it's like code changes, where someone makes a code change and it's in the code now, and no one knows why it works like that anymore. Mm. You can't touch it. And so that reminded me of that other thing. Yeah. yeah. You might be interested in this book. Oh, yeah, it sounds pretty really cool. Matters. It's an over book, but it's 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 you know like good war stories. I think that that's a good way to teach more than what like showing somebody a pattern is because they might not, they might see the pattern and get it, but not know how painful it is to not have it. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I like that. That that would have helped me, I think, early on too. Even today, like there's some patterns that I I really never use, and I wonder like I wonder if I should be, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to turn this thing on. Any so, other questions? What's up? Yeah, so how do you guys, um, obviously there's lots of different insurance companies and lots of different forms to fill out. Mm -hmm. And like this form from this insurance company is probably <coughs> really similar to this form from this insurance company. Right. But these guys use a social security number, these guys don't use a social security number. Yeah. Or or um, these guys, yeah, or these guys, yeah, the special case where these guys like name their First name, F name, these guys name it um, first name. Yeah. So, how do you guys store all that logic? I, do you guys, like, I mean, I mean that's got to be a pretty big headache. Yeah, I mean, by far, our PBM side of the team is the biggest because there's just different strategies. They have to solve those problems differently. Yep. Um, from the EHR side, we're facaded from it, but if you were to go look at their code, which I have, it's pretty much like, you know, figure out which strategy we need here and apply it. Some of them are standards integrated, so they're a lot more similar, but even when even when you get multiple entities implementing the same standard, you have things that they just don't do right, or that that even the standard may be gray area, right? Yeah. So there's different ways to implement that standard, and so you have to be pretty flexible. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much which strategy to use whole different set of code pretty much. But I think that we try to get people to do things similarly. Are there rules in code? Um, yeah, I would say so. We don't have any kind of like workflow engine or something like that if you, if that's kind of what you mean. But um, it'd be interesting to see other value in us having that. I don't know. We're pretty Ruby centric right now. So. So, so when you make your changes uh, that you show, like you're iterating through to, to simplify the code, mm -hmm. and you run unit tests, do you run performance tests as well to see? We have performance tests, but I rarely see them just in like the set of tests we run while we're changing the code. Um, we're starting to see some things where people will change code to do something like use a cache or get data in one trip versus multiple. And those are things that are kind of uh, finding their way into the set of unit tests. Like you could have perf tests for like 
make sure the cache is used. But we do have also like um, higher level perf tests that are <coughs> measuring throughput and response times and things okay. like that. So yeah. we watch, we have like basically a test engineer who's, that's his job, and he monitors things going up or things going down and, and like sends out. Test over versions or something? Yeah, exactly. Like if, if the response time starts slowing down for something, he's going to talk to people. Um, okay. I, I think that falls again in the category of if you want something done, make it their job. And that's his job. Because it is really hard to, when I'm just doing this stuff, to think about the performance impact of right. the entire system. It can be really difficult. Um, and I think that, that it works out well because we can keep moving fast. <laughs> With all the demands we have, we need to keep moving fast. And so you don't even care about if this is going to kill your performance, you just make the changes and Well, the best. I mean, we care. Um, but the system I was changing that in, the impact would be pretty hard to have done anything major. Um, there's areas uh, of our code that are much more central that okay. we're definitely having we would have a lot more care about that kind of thing. Like, okay. you know, if I if say that change doubled the request time, it wouldn't be so bad, oh. you know, because a lot of it's back end process. So no, there's no user sitting there waiting on something. It's like, you know, we might notice that request times are slower and we get alerted about it, but it wouldn't affect anybody that directly, I don't think. Um, but if we're talking about the portal where it's a UI, they click and they expect to see something back, much bigger deal. Um, also, some background processes that deal with a lot more uh, concurrency, it'd be a much bigger deal. And so, um, those teams are just more diligent about that. Uh, you know, not that I'm trying to be, like, no, no, mad no, at it. Not, you know? I'm sorry. That's, you know, exactly. Yeah. Cap, so it's kind of okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I think it, it's, like, a big growing point for us. We've been looking at other languages and stuff, too, because there's certainly some of those hot pads um, Ruby's not the fastest language by far, so um, we've thought about using Elixir or something like Go or whatever just to optimize some of our backend stuff. It's definitely being talked about. And the team I'm moving to, it would be a huge part of our job to, um, it's really just going to be two of us and then I think it'll, it's going to grow to four. And like, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be kind of uh, demanding, I think, you know, uh, to be put in that spot because we work with a lot of smart people and I think they're putting it on us to essentially improve resiliency, performance, all that stuff that matters a lot and um, I don't know, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> uh, there was a Go book that came out last fall, I think, uh, Kernahan, the, the original author of the C programming language, uh, oh, yeah. actually, you know, authored a book on Go. So if you do look at Go, you know, that's kind of like the go-to reference right now. Okay, cool. Uh, as, a, as a good starting point. It's written similar to like how the C programming language was written. Nice. You know, back in the day. So yeah. This is... <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's a good book. Yeah. What's up? You mentioned your image like a Cortex team. So uh -huh. it wasn't in the 